This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Hello and a happy new year to one and all and welcome to Scotland Speaks. With Alex Salmond, I knew I would get a word in edgeways. And to our last, our fourth of our series of four shows with our favourite bits and of course Scotland's Hidden Heroes. And in today's show we feature some of our favourite parts from series number one. Now as you well know, politics is the main theme of Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond and particularly Scottish independence. But we do venture to other areas but we always promise good debate. And what better place to look at our first set of excerpts than the best debate of all time which took place at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival at the hit show, The Eyes Have It. The eyes have it. Which took the fringe by storm. Welcome everyone to the grand finale of the eyes have it, the eyes have it. This is debate number 10 and we have a great evening in store for you today. And I'm sure you're going to behave yourself like the audience before you have not behaved themselves. The news, led by the Right Honourable David Davis, joined by Baroness Claire Fox and from Broxburn Academy, 14-year-old Sarah. Please welcome your team for the eyes. The Right Honourable Alex Salmond, joined by from Broxburn Academy, 15-year-old Lena. Eleanor Lang. I remember a few years ago, as you will, the 2014 referendum campaign, when I was assured by the no side by people like David that there was no oil and gas left in the North Sea. It was all gone, it was finished, it was over, it was done with. Last week, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak announces another 150 licenses. Where did it all come from? Magic. Magic, and the vampire magician who was on immediately before us is responsible for Rishi Sunak finding all that oil and gas in the North Sea. And he said, we'll see whether we can run, whether we can run our own country. Well, you've had an SNP First Minister, an SNP First Minister for nearly 10 years. How's that worked out? Climbing, climbing hospital waiting lists, falling school standards, fraudulent ferries, gentlemen. Remember Theresa May? Now is not the time. You were in Theresa May's government, weren't you, David? Now is not the time. When is the time? Why do they dictate when the time is? That's for us to decide when the time is for our own vote. Now, in Edinburgh, and I can say that because I do come from here, there is a saying, you'll have had your tea. <laughs> Their view is, well, you've had your vote. Now you've had your vote, get back to the speaker tent and stop speaking. Not going to happen. We're big enough strong enough, bold enough, intelligent and brave enough to be independent. Make a resounding eye tonight. We then have Humza Yusuf pushing juryless rape trials. Juries are the basis of democracy. These people do not believe in freedom. 
and we are a country of problem solvers. I believe in Scotland and I believe we could solve the problems that come with independence. So let the eyes have it. Thank you. Now this debate isn't about whether Scotland has a mandate for independence or whether we should have a referendum. This debate is about whether we should be independent. And I believe until we do more to convince those who are against it, we shouldn't be independent. Now, I'd accept not being in the United Kingdom, but I can't accept not being in a united Scotland. Until it's clear that the vast majority of Scots support it, I think you should vote nay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I now have to fulfil my role as the impartial, independent chair of the debates. I'm very quick at counting. <laughs> and the result is as follows. The eyes. 48%. The nose, 52%. I declare. <laughs> Point of order, Mr. Salmon. To have a count, let's have a real count, not a Tory count. You can recount as often as you like. I'm the impartial independent chair. Order, Point of order, Miss Ahmed Sheikh. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. You may well be the impartial chair, but I'm the producer of the show. And I say, <laughs> the eyes have it. Well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who gets strong next to you. And if I have and we're going to bow up to three, we're never going to write, we'll try again. One, two, three, thank you. Well, David Davis, how are you? Are you in recovery mode from a, a run and the, the eyes have it, the eyes have it? Just a bit, I mean, playing the cross between uh, Alan Bastard and Dick Darcy for ten days. <laughs> It's a little wearing sometimes. Uh, the, the first, I mean, the first outing was unbelievable. I mean, I think you had your entire fan club there. That was my family, actually. <laughs> All 400 of them. Well, 40, yeah, well, it was a big family. <laughs> that was one where I had to throw away the speech to start again. But no, it's been a, re it's been a really I mean, fun, yeah, it's been a fun exercise. You're right, tiring, you know, because every day for 10 days. Um, uh, and obviously we're on we're on the not, not normally on the winning side, but it's you know it's uh, it's incredibly important too. That's why I came because it's important. As you just explained for the viewers, your reference to Alan Batard Batard yeah. yeah. is the famous Rick Mayo Tory MP actually sat for your constituency. Yeah, is that right? For Holton Price, he was a member of Holton Price. In fact, um, when uh, the because the, the, the name changed in the middle of my tenure there. And That's it, the name of the constituency, not your name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they, 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 I only changed to protect the guilty. But the the uh, when it when it actually changed to Holton Price, the BBC, as you know, issues a briefing on every constituency uh, in the country at the beginning of each election with with a list of the candidates, and they they told the story of Alan Bastard represents Holton Price, and they said, Mr. Davis, underlined, who is nothing like Mr. Bastard. You could all, uh, no, it's completely untrue, and you, and you and you and you could almost see the libel lawyers having written their written their script. But there we are. But yeah, but you, you're far more right wing than that fictional character, <laughs> David. You, you said for, before I just distracted us down the the, the highways and byways of uh, of fictional Tory MPs. Yeah. You said you thought it was important. Now, I mean, I mean, obviously it was great fun. Yeah, it was enjoyable. I think the audiences enjoyed it oh, undoubtedly uh, as yeah. much as we did. Hmm. But important. Yeah. Look, I've been, and we've both been in politics for about three decades or so. Uh, you know, representative politics, as it were. In that time, the public debate has sort of shrunk. In, in well, I was going to say in Britain or the United Kingdom, <coughs> but it's actually shrunk across the world. Yeah. Um, and why is it shrunk? Well, all sorts of reasons. The sort of intolerance for the other, the other person, other person's point of view, has grown. Social media has become like an amplifier, almost to the point of being a lynch mob from time to time. You, you see it with the way J.K. Rowling was treated, that sort of thing. But uh, and the, uh, so lo in lots and lots of issues uh, from. Brexit to social issues, right across the board, 
instead of having a debate, these you see a shrinking into separate echo chambers. So you know you have the Remainers in one echo chamber and the Brexiteers in one echo chamber, for example. Yeah, and look, they both got points to make. Uh, actually accurate true points and they should be talking to each other you know I always say that you know debate is a, a creative process it's like ideas having sex you know it's fun <laughs> <laughs> that's a simile is working its way through my mind yes <laughs> yeah, well it's generally fun and sometimes productive <laughs> <laughs> you got there yeah. Welcome back. Of course, as Taz rightly says, Scottish independence and how to get there is the underlying theme of our series. But we also spent a, a couple of programmes looking at uh, one of the great social issues facing Scotland, the housing crisis, and in particular the battle for Wineford, where the residents in Mary Hill are conducting a, a David and Goliath struggle against uh, the giant housing association, the Wheatley Group. And it's fair to say that thus far, David is getting in a few hefty blows. Well, I'm here in Wineford with uh, three of the local campaigners and residents who've got severe misgivings about this great demolition plan. I I'm here with Angie, with Kaz and with Peter. Angie, can I start with you? I mean, you're a long-term resident of Wineford, aren't you? Yes, I am. Lived here for a long time. Um, lovely place to live in, Wineford. Um, my daughter was about three when we moved in here, and she's 47 now. Um, <laughs> Time flies, doesn't it? Went to Wineford Primary School. It goes, flies by so quickly. I uh, went to Wineford Primary School, loved it. Um, uh, my concerns is the place has changed a lot over the years, and a lot of it, I feel, is due to bad management by factors, decisions. And, and you don't think things. this demolition plan is a change for the better, then? I don't think so. I definitely don't think so. Why? Why bring down buildings that, if they're okay, sound, okay, you know, safe, why don't you just renovate them and let them be used for families to move into right away? Guys, I, I you'd like nothing better than to have suitable accommodation here, but you've got particular family pressures, don't you? Yeah, um, my youngest son Liam is disabled, he's a few different conditions, he uses a wheelchair and he's in a gastric line, um, he's a stricture in his throat, so um, it was hard enough to get a, a, a rented area that we could afford up here and coming to the Wineford gave me the community and the price we could afford, I could meet my children's school needs. This demolition and being like 20 feet from 120 block um, and the hazards that brings would cause severe deterioration in my son's health. This is your young lad Liam, isn't it? And yeah. you're very worried that the, the pressure, the noise, the dust uh, of a huge demolition will be very adverse for his own health. Exactly, yep. Yep, exactly that. He has a stricture in his throat, the dust, the pulling, the time it takes to pull down the flat, the time they recycle all the materials they want to, and the toxic dust would force me out of this home because his health would deteriorate so much it wouldn't be tolerable at all. And I would lose my community, I would lose my location. I've got a kid that 
Clevedon Secondary School as well, who's in fourth year. So, um, yeah, it would basically rip apart everything that me and my family have came to grow and love and be part of in the Wineford for the last five years. Now, Peter, you're a veteran of a number of uh, Wineford community campaigns, the school campaign of a, a few years ago. Is this the, the worst proposal yet uh, affecting this community? Well, you know, it's up there with the schools coming down because the schools were like the heart of the community. They just the same way I done one initial school and a non denominational school right beside each other. You know, and it was fantastic, you know. The kids would go to the schools and then, you know, everybody was, you know, it was very, very good, you know, but it feels like the heart's been took out of our community when, this, when the schools went. But this latest thing, you know, I mean, we're in a housing crisis at the moment, homeless housing crisis. When the flats are structurally sound, they could be refitted easy. Because one of the things about Wineford, I mean, this was a planned community. Yes, that's uh, right, and yeah. so things like the, the nature of the different nature of the housing, the, the tower blocks, the schools, the, the whole ecosystem. Yes. Uh, I think that's what architects say. The, the ecosystem was, was actually a, a styled and planned community. Yes. And now bits are being ripped away from it. Yeah, well, the thing is, you I mean, I don't know if it, you know, when they built this game, they just they seem to get it right for some reason. You know, I mean, I've lived in other places in Glasgow, but when they were building this, they just they just seem to have got it right. You know, for a, a number of reasons, I don't know why, but it seems to work. You know, the way they built it. And Angie, would that be your view as a, a longer term resident here? Well, it is my view. I couldn't have said it any better, Peter, <laughs> um, because really they have done it a good job when these were first built in the sixties. Um, they suited everybody the flats, the masonettes, the bison flats, access to two good schools who my daughter went to and also went to after school hours because there was these schools were our community where kids went to them, where kids had parties in them, kids had Christmas parties in them. They done a big thing in keeping a community together and they used to have the brownies for the younger children, for the boys as well. Um, they've done everything in here together as a community. And I'm just very saddened that this is happening in the community that I moved to and thought I would be happy to live here forever and I still want to live here, but I'm saddened that they want to take... The, when they were built in the 60s, that's concrete and metal. They've outlived half of the houses that have been built and had been brought down. You know, so why do this? It just doesn't make sense when we're having a crisis with everything in society just now, you know, financially. The it seems a remarkable thing to and spend £78 million pounds and turn 600 houses into 300. Well, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I totally agree. That's my point. Why do that when everybody's struggling, you know, and we need to affordable housing because that's what this is. This Wineford was about houses for affordable people to afford. Kaz, if you had the opportunity to speak directly, let's just imagine you're speaking directly to the Wheatley Group, to, to Glasgow Council. As a, as a mother, what would your plea to them be? To retain these buildings, to retrofit them, to extend the social housing stock mm -hmm. um, throughout my, son's, my young son's life getting houses and waiting on housing that are wheelchair accessible and um, meet the needs of schools in the areas. It's caused me so much disjointed moving. I've moved three times and I've been in the private let sector because I can't get it to the social housing let. To take these buildings down, the houses that they build, I still won't be able to afford. They're not social homes, I won't get them. So again, I'm getting uprooted and moved and it's um, it's ripping the sense of community. I'm a full-time carer and, and being part of a community and having things to do and link in and help as well as having people help me in my times and needs is very important, especially this day and age with everything that's going on with everybody. So I just see it's like um, defragmenting people's roots and their emotions and um, pushing people that are already in dire situations further down and the homeless people. It's just ridiculous, the families that are what they're going through. Welcome back. Today I'm here at the Wineford Estate with Alex, documenting the story of a number of activist tenants who are seeking to prevent the demolition of 600 properties in four blocks of flats here on this estate. Alex now speaks to a member of the Scottish Tenants Association, Nick Jury. 
And I'm delighted to be joined by Nick Dury, one of the, the key activists coordinating this community campaign in Wineford. Nick, thank you for coming on to the uh, Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmon. Pleasure to be here, Alec. Nick, the argument that you would have is this community is being threatened with uh, the demolition against your will of these flats, 600 social rented houses being limited to 200 or even less. But the other side would say, look, isn't it time for these high-rise monstrosities from the 1960s to come down and make way for, for better housing, better social housing for the future? Well, isn't there anything in their argument? Well, they're going to spend £73 million, mostly public money. And we know that these flats can be retrofitted, turned into family-sized homes for far less money. Their own reports state that they can do that. So we're sat here with a massive housing crisis. You know, 16,000 bairns homeless. A city the size of Perth homeless. 244,000 people on a council house waiting list. And here we are getting rid of 600 socially rented homes. Now, don't get us wrong, we're, we're not, you know, we're, we're reasonable people. Had the Wheatley Group and the Council come and said, we're going to give you 600 social homes as a replacement, maybe we wouldn't have had an argument. But the fact that they were initially mooting 300 mid-market rent homes, now obviously they're not saying that in public anymore, but that's what we heard from one of the local SNP councillors. So uh, it's, it, it, we're in the position that, you know, these could be let out tomorrow, handling the housing crisis. They could be retrofitted to a, a, a passive house standard. You know? Now you've got some pretty high power support from some of the, the best known architects in Scotland. Uh, how did you manage to mobilise that sort of interest in, in what you were saying? Well, uh, through one-to-one -one meetings. Um, you know, I, I met with the uh, Commonwealth Director and then uh, you know, we, we had a discussion with Malcolm Fraser. Malcolm Fraser gave us a number of introductions. Now, Malcolm Fraser, the famous architect, also yeah. chair of Commonweal, yeah. the, the think tank organisation. Yeah, and uh, that, that was great. So, you know, we got an introduction to Professor Miles Glendinning, who um, happened to have a photocopy of the, the plans for the building and, you know, all these kind of things. So one thing led to another, but, um, you know, we, we're not, uh, we're not numpties sat in the Wineford who don't, you know, we're, we're kind of treating treated like that in the sense that like it's it's mushrooms you know you're kept in the darkness but you know this is a community with skilled people we can we can do that kind of because the wine fund as originally envisaged in the 1960s was a, a pretty model estate yeah. it was a you know envisaged as a community with a variety of housing with the flats with the maisonettes with the schools of course locally yeah. Uh, do you think the, the, the Wheatley Group and the Council really understand the, the full background to this area? I, I just don't think they see the value in, in Harold Buto's vision. You know, the, the, the now, who was he? He was the chief architect for uh, the Scottish Special Housing Association. And the scheme was developed supposedly along the Roehampton model. So it's quite an interesting thing because it was developed in tension to council housing. Um, the original... Uh, 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 say so came from Harold Macmillan so it was a Conservative government was building this to show how you could do public housing well as opposed to just throwing up houses and we love this community you know we've fought for this community for you know as long as I've here been here that there has been a residents association fighting to improve things and it seems you know we've had a change of the guard we had a new landlord with the Wheatley group and they just came in and thought we'll do the same we do everywhere else pull buildings down because Harold Macmillan was the greatest force in Conservative, progressive Conservative housing policy as housing minister, later prime minister, of course. And John Wheatley, of course, was the greatest force in the Labour Party's evolution of housing policy. Now, the Wheatley have just adopted the, his name. They, they yeah. used to be the Glasgow Housing uh, uh, Authority. Do you think they're misusing, abusing the, the legend of John Wheatley? Oh, I think it's so tough. I, I mean, the, the, the way that the Wheatley group behaves is the way that the GHA behaved before. You know, this is a, a, a company created from, you know, the largest, uh, largest council landlord in the country, and they demolished by their own admission 17,500 homes and rebuilt just over 3,000. So th that would not be what John Wheatley would have been about. You know? he, he would have demolished 3,000 and, <laughs> and established 17,000. Exactly. Think. We know that the, the amount of public homes that have been demolished in Glasgow has been a great contributor to the, the housing crisis. And the landlord that we're up against is, you know, they're the architect of that.
Welcome back and to my favourite part of the show, which is your tweets, emails and messages, which I love to read out each week and in particular, your ideas for future shows. Now, before I read out your messages from last week, I must answer one burning question that keeps popping up in our email inbox and that is, what are the names of my kittens? They're and not, they are... Tasmina, they're not kittens anymore, they're full-grown cats. They're babies. They're kittens. Those who have cats will know that these are kittens. They're both under one, therefore they are kittens. And the names are Moeza and Nyla, both Arabic names. So I hope you enjoy watching them. Today they're being particularly good. And now to your messages. Donald says, when Alex was speaking to Alan McCaskill and he explained how all the offshore experienced companies were bypassed on the wind generation auction sale, I could feel the cold hand of the English colonial government in Scotland steering the process. Hence the reason Scotland only got a one-off 700 million. Shocking. Anyhow, team, all the best for 2024 and keep up the great work. Kizzy says, another great show. Maybe Alex Hammond will be one of Scotland's heroes. Pim says, thanks for another great programme. Really enjoyed seeing Ash introducing her bill again and also seeing her doing so well in Holyrood. Also enjoyed Alex's interview with Gerard Burns. Is it Aaron still hanging on the wall of the First Minister's office? Well, Pim, I find out and the answer to that is no. Uh, Miss Sturgeon decided not to keep it and it is back with Gerard. Pim goes on to say, I think Dory's portrait is just remarkable. Thanks for sharing. A good new year to all. I hope it brings peace and prosperity. Sarah Alba. P.S. My new heroes, Moira Brown and Gerard Burns. Charlie says, quoting Robert Burns, given it's Burns season, I suppose, I have often said to myself, what are the advantages Scotland reaps from this so-called union that can counterbalance the annihilation of her independence and her very name? Chris Wilson says, finally, come on, people. Scotland would vote to end the union tomorrow. We all know this. We need a leader that would just get up and get on with this. Alex. And so say all of us. And now it's competition time. Now, as you know, over the series of programmes, we had 14 what we describe as Scotland's hidden heroes. That's people who've done amazing things, but somehow have not been given the uh, acknowledgement by history that they deserve. Now, the competition is this. You've got to choose from the 14, which we've shown over the last few weeks, uh, the best three, my favourite three, the ones that I would say were the best, in any order you like. I've got them written down here because this is totally above board. So the competition is to guess what my three hidden heroes are out of the 14 that have been broadcast. And I should say that of some of the entries we've had in, at least one person has got them totally right. So well done, and there's still a chance to win some great goodies. But what are these wonderful prizes? And let's just emphasise, just because one person has already got them right doesn't mean there aren't options for others. Because remember, you've also got to nominate your own hidden hero to be broadcast in future episodes. Well, let's just say that the goodies are a surprise. A January 2024 surprise for the worthy winners. And one final clue. The three hidden heroes that I've selected from that cast of 14, let's say there's two men and one woman, and the woman is formidable, or perhaps formidable would be a better description. That's a big clue. And if you do want to enter the competition and choose those top three Alex Salmon choices from Scotland Hidden Heroes, all you need to do is to write in to us at the show at alexsalmon.scot with your three, and then we'll select everyone who gets all three right will get a prize, that is a promise. And we'll see you after the break.
Welcome back. And now we turn to our final selection of our favourite bits from Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond in series number one. Now we featured, as you know, domestic politics and a number of issues facing the people of Scotland and indeed across these islands. But we also cast a look internationally and of course of most import and relevance in currency is a crisis in the Middle East. We spoke for an on-the-spot summation of what was going on to Peter Oborn. And if there's been a, a more passionate, on-the-spot and thoroughly committed report on the real situation facing the people of Palestine, then I've yet to hear it. This is what Peter had to say. It is seldom that an international issue dominates the UK political discourse, but currently the appalling slaughter in Gaza is setting the course of domestic politics, as witnessed the demise of the erstwhile Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. The UK government have relentlessly backed Israel from day one of the conflict. They've been shadowed by the leader of the opposition, but increasingly, public opinion has been touched by the plight of the Palestinians caught in the crossfire between the IDF and Hamas, and dissent has been growing within the Labour Party as a death toll mounts on a daily basis. However, the consequences of war in the Middle East go far beyond their implications for UK politics. They are epoch-making and world-changing. Alex speaks to the renowned journalist Peter Oborn from Nablus in occupied West Bank. Peter Oborn, we're seeing the horrific scenes from Gaza daily on our television screens. What are conditions like in Nablus in the occupied West Bank? Well, they're nowhere near as bad as the sheer horror, Dante's Inferno, which is taking place in Gaza. Um, but it is, nevertheless, it's tough. We are starting to see, it reminds me a little bit of an episode in British history you will be familiar with, Alex, the Highland Clearances, the ethnic cleansing of communities, uh, particularly not around Nablus so much, but further to the south, so in Mustafa Yat and in the Hebron, South Hebron Hills, you're getting villages being wiped out, people driven, drive, driven out of their villages. And around here in Nablus, which is a beautiful, ancient Roman city, we are under siege. You, you can't get out. The roads aren't working, they're blocked. You can't go out south towards Ramallah through the usual route. You have to go up into the hills to avoid roadblocks, to avoid checkpoints, to avoid marauding settlers. So it's it's an uneasy atmosphere, and the settlers are very violent. They go into the villages, they beat people up, they they have machine guns, um, they stop the villagers, the local people, from collecting their olives. Often they steal the olives. It's a terrifying time for ordinary Palestinians. They're not like the horror scenes we are seeing all the time from Gaza. And what's the, the, the feeling of... Uh... Palestinians on the West Bank, uh, as they see the, the uh, country people, the, the relatives uh, in Gaza uh, suffering to the such extremity? Well, what they see, almost every Palestinian has relatives, as you say, in Gaza. Uh, and there's a tremendous feeling um, when you talk to people of solidarity, but also shock. You know, it is. It, you can't witness what is happening in Gaza without feeling a human sort of horror. And of course, if you're Palestinian, you feel that this could be happening to you, and you fear that this they, they will come uh, once Gaza is over. It will come to the West Bank too. Now, Peter Oban, if I may say so, you're unusual in right of centre commentators in the UK in that you have a, a deep knowledge of the Middle East and, and your sympathies have been largely with the, the Palestinian cause. Why is that such a, an unusual position for a commentator or right of centre figure in the, in the UK? It's quite an interesting point you're, you're making there. Uh, I think something happened to the Conservative Party which used to have, as you know, there was this Tory Arabist, as they called it, uh, tradition. But something happened to the Conservative Party. It was captured by America. 
by the neoconservatives, which is American politics, as you know, is very sympathetic at the highest level. We see this with Joe Biden to uh, uh, to, to the Israelis, and they have lot are detached from the plight of the ordinary Palestinians. They they seem to have lost sympathy, and actually, I uh, I see a continuity here with the Iraq War, that where once again there's a very one sided view of what takes takes place in the Middle East. Nobody's ever going to, you should never forget the awful things which happened, Alex, to the to, 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 to the Israelis on the 7th of October, the atrocities committed by Hamas against them. But you, how can you watch the inferno that Gaza has become uh, or listen to the awful talk we're getting now from Israeli leaders, you know, Netanyahu conjuring up biblical genocide, the Amalek language, which is really not something you expect from a secular democracy, what claims to be a secular democracy like Israel. And of course, as you look back to series number one, no collection would be at all complete without a look at our tribute show to the late, great Dr Winifred Ewing. And what would we give uh, now to have someone with an ounce of the grit and determination of Madame de Cos. Welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond and to a very special programme celebrating the, the life and work of Winifred Ewing. Here in the Professor's Square at Glasgow University, it hasn't changed much since a, a day 70 years ago. Uh, a young woman proudly graduated from here with an MA LLB, Winifred Margaret Woodburn. She came on to be a lawyer of some note in the, in the city of Glasgow as uh, secretary of the Bar Association. But it was 15 years later, in 1967, that she dazzled her way onto the Scottish political scene by storming the Labour citadel of Hamilton. And Scottish politics, indeed Scotland, has never been the same since. As Winnie Ewing, that lady went on to serve in three parliaments, in Westminster, in the European Parliament, and in the Scottish Parliament, where famously from the chair in 1999, she declared that a parliament that was uh, adjourned 300 years ago was hereby reconvened. So today we celebrate the life and work of Winifred Ewing. We speak to journalists, we speak to opponents and rivals, we speak to the family who knew her and loved her best. Let us take you to the scenes of last Saturday at the Inverness Cathedral in the Highlands when there was an outpouring of love and affection at the memorial service of the late, great, wonderful and much loved Dr Winifred Ewing. Away to the westward I'm longing to be where the beauties of heaven unfold by the sea, where the sweet purple heather blooms fragrant and free. On a hilltop high above the dark Winnie could light up any campaign and any street. People often ask, what was her campaigning method? As if they could somehow bottle it and take it away. Her secret was simple. Winnie loved people and they loved her back. It made her quite simply the, the finest election campaigner that Scotland has ever seen. Finally, her steadfast love of country and her pole star of independence. Thus even opponents who vehemently disagreed still respected this and then respected Winnie and therefore her cause. Fellow SNP members who argued with her, and there were a few from time to time, but they still liked her and by and large she liked them. All of this made 
Winnie Ewing, the most significant Scottish nationalist of the 20th century. Eagles in flight as they circle high above the dark island. Oh, while of my. By winning Hamilton, as Alex said, Winnie not only changed the face of Scottish politics, she changed the face of British politics forever. She catapulted the issue of Scottish independence from the periphery of Scottish politics into becoming the biggest issue of the day. For me, when I'm back once more upon the dark island. And with that, we come to the end, sadly, of today's episode of Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond and we very much hope you've enjoyed our festive editions as much as we've enjoyed bringing them to you. Now we're back again next week as usual but not at the usual time and not on the usual day. Series 2 will be broadcast on Saturday mornings at 10am. Before the football. Very importantly, before the football. In fact, you can watch us on every social media channel to quote Alex Salmond that you can shake a stick at. So it's a happy new year from Tasmina and the kittens. Of course, and a good new year from Alex Salmond. We shall see you next week. See you then. Hello and a happy new year to one and all and welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. No, I stay with Alex Salmond. Yes, you have to look like you're interrupting me. Yes, all right. Okay, okay I'll start okay. again. On his segment. Right. No, but this was my bit. Yeah. And I, I thought, well, it's my bit, yeah. and I speak. He's yeah. to look at that when he interrupts yeah, me. Alex said yeah, yeah. You, you, you should have switched to that. Yeah, part. but it wasn't in the script. Uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. right. I'm just, I'm just you okay. Input. So, it so, if, so just, just a question which camera was I looking at? The right one. Well, that one. You told us to look at that one. Welcome back and... No, this is my camera. I'm looking at the right camera. Camera's off for my bit. Yeah. Continuity. And it's a happy new year from Tasmina, from myself, and all at Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. You might say something like Oh, okay, right. And so it's a happy new year. <laughs> 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 and so it's Happy New Year from Tasmina, from myself, and all that Scotland speaks with I, Alex Salmon. Sorry. You want to come in with Alex Salmon? No, no, no. Right, okay. And so it's Happy New Year from Tasmina, myself, and all that Scotland speaks with Alex Salmon. And of course, from all of us to you, Alex, a belated but very happy birthday to you. Now, coming up in this week's show. Don't you that. <laughs> you were going to do I was, that. I was waiting for presents. Right. And so it's Happy New Year from Tasmina, myself, and all that Scotland speaks with Alex Sam. And a belated but very happy birthday from all of us to you. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going then, right? I'll, 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 right, okay. And so it's Happy New Year from. <laughs> Right, shut up. Can I say I didn't think you'd make it? <laughs> and so it's Happy New Year from Tasmina, myself. <laughs> and with that, we come to an end for today's. To the end.